Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, we just thank you that we can gather together tonight to worship you, to study your word, and Lord, as we go through the book of Corinthians, Lord, just open it up to our hearts and our lives. Lord, there's so many lessons there that uh, are for us as well as the Corinthian church, and we just need to learn them, and I thank you, Lord, that you're so patient, and your spirit opens up your word to our hearts and our lives. And Lord, as we worship you tonight, we want to honor you, glorify you, Lord. And may these songs just touch our hearts and draw us close to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And last week, we kind of, or last time, not last week, we had a couple Thursdays off because of the snow, but we divided the book up. Uh, like this, and it's pretty simple. The first six, six chapters, chapters one through six, Paul's basically dealing with some problems in the church. He's trying to correct their errors, their sin. Then in chapters seven through 16, Paul's basically answering questions that the church in Corinth had and most likely was found in a letter that was sent to Paul, also word of mouth by those who brought the letter from Corinth. So to kind of set the stage for what we're going to be studying tonight, Keep in mind that Paul went to Corinth um, and uh, went to Corinth. He went to Athens where he encountered the Epicurean philosophers first. And the Epicurean philosophers, they're kind of an interesting breed. They felt the chief purpose in life was pleasure and happiness. It's kind of interesting. That's kind of the idea in the church today, too. You know, pleasure and happiness. It's all about that. Now, if you really think about it, it's holiness. That's, a, that's what God desires in our lives holiness. I'll tell you what, there is tremendous joy when you obey the Lord and you follow after him. But they were after pleasure and holiness. It wasn't that they denied the existence of God, but they felt that the gods didn't interact with man. Paul also encountered the Stoics who were pantheistic in their beliefs, believing that God was everything and everything was God. And both these, good, God, both these groups, I should say, were the intellectuals of their day and they were trying to explain life. But in doing so, they neglected, neglected the giver and the sustainer of life, Jesus Christ. That was their problem. And Paul spoke to them on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. And he kind of did so in a kind of a philosophical way. He did touch on the resurrection, but he kind of spoke on their level. And it was hard because the results of his efforts were told in Acts 17 verses 32 through Part of 34, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. These men, like many people today, like to hear new things, new information. But that's all it is, is new. And don't you see that with a lot of Christians today? What's the newest thing? Oh, we got blood moons over here. We got this going on over here. We got that going on. And they're just jumping all over the place from one thing to another. But what is it doing in their lives? Is it changing them? Is it just about information or is it about transformation? You see, that's the key. The Word of God opened up to us by the Spirit of God should be transforming our lives. And that's what Paul's going to talk about as we move on through this letter tonight. And for these philosophers, it didn't change them, it didn't move them. And went in one ear and out the other. And many who listened to Paul came as they are left as they came, lost and dead in their trespasses and sins. Oh, we'll hear you again when we have a more opportune time. What's that? It's blowing them off. <laughs> yeah, we're going to call you. Sure. Wait by the phone, right? Now, here's the thing. What if Paul spiced it up a little bit? What if he brought this big band with him? had this huge light show, smoke coming out, you know. You think that would have been better? Some feel that way. But not Paul. As Paul goes to Corinth, he continues to keep the main thing the main thing. What's the main thing? Well, Jesus Christ and his resurrection is the main thing. That's what it's all about. One writer summed it up like this. He wrote, Paul proclaimed the gospel of Christ crucified constantly in his ministry to the Corinthians so that their faith would stand in God's power, not men. In so doing, he brought them into a relationship with the Holy Spirit, the source of all true spirituality. And, you know, keep in mind, the Corinthians were kind of, I guess we call them a wild group of people. They were known 
for their immoral lifestyles. They loved philosophy. They loved human wisdom. And it, this had all come into the church. And it started to divide the church. And as we have seen and will continue to see, Paul's going to address that carnal spirit that they had, even though they thought they were very spiritual. And they weren't. Now, as we will see as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul continues on speaking about what he spoke about in chapter 1. The cross and the power of God to save. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24, Paul put it like this. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. See, man's wisdom says you have to do something great. You have to accomplish some great feat to get into heaven or come before God. But Paul was telling them that it's not through human wisdom that we're saved. We're saved by the life and death of Jesus Christ as he paid in full the penalty for our sin. You see, it's what Jesus has done and not what we have done. And it seemed foolish to the Greeks and to the Jews. It was a stumbling block because they felt it was through their sacrifices that they made to God that saved them. And it didn't. Well, I guess they were partly right. It was the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins, paying our debt in full, a debt we can never pay, repay for our sins. That was the sacrifice that saved us. It was a once and for all sacrifice, not a daily sacrifice. A lamb could never take away your sins, but the Lamb of God could, and he has. You see the difference? We have to come to God through Jesus, and Paul is going to continue showing us that this is a heavenly wisdom and not a human wisdom. So keep that in mind. We're going to pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study through his word. Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. When Paul arrived in Corinth, and you can read of that in Acts chapter 18, he met a Christian couple named Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers, as Paul was, and as Paul ministered to the people of Corinth, he supported himself by his tent making for a year and a half that he was there. And I want you to understand, Paul didn't come to Corinth as some philosopher or some salesman. He came as a witness of the living God, Jesus Christ. And maybe Paul was down after his time in Athens. You know, he, he had an opportunity between, before these philosophers, and it didn't amount to much. And, you know, that's disheartening. You lay it all on the line and you're like, man, not much happened there. Things didn't go well. Not a lot of fruit. And now here I am in Corinth. I mean, this is a wicked, immoral place. Very dark. And how is the gospel message going to go forth here? That's human reasoning, right? And he was so overwhelmed by it all that we're told that he came to them in, in verse 3 here, in weakness and fear and much trembling. Have you ever thought of Paul that way? I mean, think about this guy. I mean, I, I see this guy as a tough dude, man. Nothing's going to stop. Look what he's saying. In weakness and fear and trembling. Are you kidding me, Paul? Weak, fearful, trembling at the work that was before him. Yes, that was Paul. What did he do? Drop out of the ministry? Hide in fear? Disappear? Nobody saw him anymore? Absolutely not. Listen to what he went on to say in verses 4 and 5 again. In my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
Paul shared his human ability, his human strength. It wasn't too good. That was the reality. But Paul tells him, I didn't come to you guys in the power of my might, but in the power of God. My preaching was not just worldly ideas, but in the power of God's Spirit working in and through me. And the salvation message went forward, and many came to know the Lord. See, that's a good perspective for us to have. Paul saw his weakness, and in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he was able to say, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, how many of you, when you read the story of Samson, see him as this Atlas type of guy? We all do. I mean, that's just the picture we have in our mind. This guy was a tough dude. He was strong. Muscles everywhere. He picked things up and he put them down. You know what I mean? No. I think Samson was my size, probably. A little weak guy. Why? Because it wasn't in the power of Samson. It was in the power of God that he did these things. Right? And we miss that. We think, you know, we've got to be so strong and powerful. No, God uses weak vessels to do great things. We just need to surrender to him. I like that. And we also need to keep the main thing the main thing. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hey, that's the message, guys. Like it or not, that's the message I'm giving to you. I'm not getting caught up in philosophical debates or side issues, but Christ crucified the power of God unto salvation. Now, here's the thing that we've got to remember, because many cults, many false religions love to take you down these rabbit trails and debate all kinds of things. Keep the main thing the main thing. It's Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead. Look at the cults. Do they believe Jesus is God? No. The majority don't. They may say he is a God, but not Almighty God. You keep the main thing, the main thing. Who is Jesus and what has he done? Now, it's not you can't talk about other issues, but always bring it back to the main issue, Jesus Christ. And we have to be careful as preachers, as teachers, or really any Christian for that matter, because it's easy to get in the way of the gospel to get in the way of Jesus. And don't, don't get in the way. Will people get upset when you say that Jesus is the only way? Absolutely. Because they feel all roads lead to God. They feel you just got to be a good person. But the main thing is Jesus. Paul said in Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You see, keep it simple. We don't have to make it complicated. And... You know, as you look here again at verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you know, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We have to remember that. Because people want to draw people into the church with all kinds of different things. Oh, we have this program and this, we got a basketball event here, and we got this going on over here, and we got that. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. But if that's the reason you're drawing people in, then it has to keep getting bigger and better. Why? Because people get used to it. Well, that's all you're doing now. You got one little smoke machine where are the lights. And it never ends. But if you preach in the power of God's Spirit, the Word of God to people, it will touch their lives. What if it doesn't? That's not your problem. That's their problem. You see, we have to remember that. 
Spurgeon said, the power that is in the gospel does not lie in the eloquence of the preacher. Otherwise, men would be the converters of souls. Nor does it lie in the preacher's learning. Otherwise, it would consist in the wisdom of men. We might preach until our tongues rotted, till we would exhaust our lungs and die. But never a soul would be converted unless the Holy Spirit be with the word of God to give it the power to convert the soul. Absolutely. Don't miss out on that. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's a power of God to salvation. And that's what we're afraid of. And so we talk about other things that are really not that important. The main thing is Jesus and his resurrection. Well, look at verse 6 here in 1 Corinthians 2. Paul said, However, we speak wisdom among, among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they, had no, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, this is what amazes me. People, even in the church, grab the wisdom of this world, and Paul tells us that this wisdom of the world, this human wisdom, comes to nothing. What wisdom is he speaking of? Well, Think about it. I mean, psychology, evolution, philosophy, and so on. It's any wisdom of man that is in opposition to the living God, and it'll be done away with, as many of man's ideas have gone away, haven't they? They just disappear because there's nothing to them. Paul warned us in, in Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10, beware, pay attention, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. We're complete in Christ. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, people today, well, aren't you embarrassed about believing in creation? Are you kidding me? I'm embarrassed for those who believe in evolution. The Big Bang Theory, are you nuts? There was nothing, or everything was condensed into this little tiny ball. And then it exploded into everything we have today. Wow, that's a nice fairy tale. It's almost as good as kissing the frog and turns into a prince, right? I'm not ashamed. I'm complete in Christ. The world is ripping me off. Think about it. When Darwin came out with his whole theory of evolution, and the church jumped on it, they were ripped off. Why? Because they forgot about Genesis. We can't believe that. That's just a story. It's not real. We believe that over millions of years, everything evolved. Shame on you. There is no evidence, zero evidence for evolution. Go look at the evolutionary tree. What do you see hanging on the evolutionary tree? All the creatures are fully formed. What happened to the intermediates? There are none. They have never been found. You mean with the millions and millions of fossils we have on record, not one intermediate fossil form is there? No. So you're, this is a theory that is taught as fact. And we have the facts that we believe is a fairy tale. How sad. These are the facts. How do I know that? Because God was there. He's the one that did it, and he's told us. And read of it. These creatures reproduce after their own kind. Trees reproduce after their own kind. What do we see? Trees reproduce after their own kind. Orange trees don't have apples growing on them. Creatures, a cat does not have a dog. That would be kind of interesting, huh? They reproduce after their own kind, just as God said. Evolution says, no, they don't. Over millions of years, they make a new kind. There is no record. Oh, what about the finches that we saw, saw on the, Agapo, the Galapagos Islands? What about those finches? They got different sized beaks. Are they all finches? Yeah. Are there different kinds of finches? Yes. So how's that evolution? Now, if you had a finch, this bird with a big trunk coming out, 
that was growing into an elephant one day, evolving, then I would say, wow, we, that's good. That is a good intermediate stage. Doesn't happen. And I don't mean to get off on that. Well, you know, we're going to be here all night because I missed two Thursdays. So, guys, we're going to be here a while. Sorry. You know, here's the thing. Paul was not going to cater to the Corinthian love of human wisdom. And it's not that Paul's message didn't have wisdom. In fact, it had more wisdom because it was the wisdom of God. God has given to us His Word, the Bible, and those words are opened to us by his, up to us by His Spirit, as we're going to see as we read on in a few minutes. Now here's kind of something that I'll throw at you, something you need to look at. When Paul speaks of these rulers of this age, is he speaking of human rulers or demonic rulers? Think about that. I think both. I think human rulers and demonic rulers because behind the scenes of human rulers are demonic forces pulling their strings. Did Satan and his demonic forces know that the Messiah was to be born and die? I think so. Right? The scriptures talk about it. Here's the thing I don't think they knew. That his death and resurrection would bring to us everlasting life. I don't think they knew that because they would not have crucified the Lord of glory if that were true. You see, what Jesus did for us has given us eternal life. They didn't want that. Now, you can play that out in human terms as well and apply the Jews and the Romans to this, because if they knew who Christ was, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory either, right? Absolutely. If the Jews recognized Jesus as their Messiah, they would have never crucified him. And the Romans as well. But they did. Well, look at verse 9 here in 1 Corinthians 2. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, some people feel that when Paul speaks here in 1 Corinthians 2.9, he's speaking of the glories of heaven. I don't think that's what Paul's speaking of here because it doesn't flow with what he's speaking of as we continue reading on through this chapter how God's Spirit reveals to his children the things of God. I think that's what it's all about. You see, man on his own through human reasoning could never come to these truths that have been revealed to us in the Scriptures. Not at all. We have five senses that reveal things to us. But I think for a Christian, there's one more. You may think I'm weird, but no. The Spirit who speaks to our hearts and opens up the Word of God to our lives. I love that. Paul is telling us that the natural eye cannot see the things of God. The natural ear cannot hear the things of God. The natural heart cannot know the things of God, the wisdom of God, because they're spiritually discerned. The reality is I can, can't even know what another person is thinking, let alone Almighty God. And yet his spirit will reveal to us the deep things of God, to those who love him, to those who are searching for him with their whole heart, to those who call upon him. Think of it like this. You know, you're reading this book. It's like 500 pages long. And you come to the end and you're like, I don't get it. What's the point? What is the author trying to say in this book? I don't understand it. Who do you go to? Some guy down the street? You know, what do you think? Read it. Tell me what you think. You know what the best thing to do is? Contact the author. You know, I've read your book. I liked it, but I'm not sure I got it. Isn't that what we do? As we're reading the Word of God and we're seeking, what is this all about? And the Holy Spirit starts revealing things to us. We ask and He shares with us. I like that. Not the wisdom of man, not human wisdom, but the wisdom of God. Now here's the thing. Can we know everything about God? No. He knows everything. How can we know everything about Almighty God? Because if I knew everything about God, how big is your God? 
I have a hard time knowing everything about my wife. Hopefully she's not listening tonight. We'll see when I get home if I'm in trouble or not. But I, I don't know everything about my wife. How can I know everything about God? And here's the thing. We can pray and ask. We, don't, we may never know something. But it says, Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. You see what Moses is saying here? We can't know everything about God, but what we know we should apply to our lives. We should walk accordingly to the high calling by which we've been called. We should live holy lives, lives that are set apart for God. There is so much that God has told us, so much that he has shown us. Now live accordingly. It's as simple as that. Well, look at verse 12 here. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but with the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Remember what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, that he is going to teach us, and teach us the things about Jesus. In John 16, 13, he said, However, when the, he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. I like that. Now, here's the thing. If you're lacking wisdom in a given situation, what do you do? Ask. Ask. God will freely give to each of us what we need in the situations that we face. Sometimes it's instantaneous. All of a sudden, God just, wow, that was unbelievable. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes it takes time. But ask. Wait upon him. Trust him. He'll give you the wisdom you need. I, I can't tell you, you know, over almost 24 years now of being up here, just seeking God's wisdom in the various situations that I've been in as pastor of this church, it's amazing. I wish I could tell you I was that smart. That's why I did the things I did. Are you kidding me? But God told me. And sometimes he told me things I didn't want to do. You know, those are difficult things. Things you have to confront. And it's hard. But you know what God wants. And now you have to walk accordingly. Just ask. Ask in faith. God is going to show you. And then walk. Isn't it amazing? We have direct insight into the mind of God by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God opened up to us by the Spirit. And as we're taught, we can teach others what God has given to us. That's the exciting thing. Share, oh, this is what God has shown me. I was going through the Word this morning and you know, He just opened this up to me. Pretty awesome. Well, here in 2 Corinthians 2, look at verses 14, starting in verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Paul is going to speak of the natural man, the spiritual man, and then as we get into the next chapter, he's going to speak of the carnal man. First of all, this natural man, the Greek word that Paul uses for natural man is sukiokos. And it's a term that speaks of someone born into this world through the natural process. Someone who's not born again, they're not a believer. And it's speaking of a material person, one who lives for the day. It speaks of the unregenerate man. And the picture here is a person who lives to satisfy his bodily appetites. And think about it. What do animals live for? to satisfy their bodily appetites. That's an animal. That's all they do. And that's the natural man. And I'm not saying that they're not smart, but even though they are alive physically, their spirit is dead. And they can't know the deep things of God. Their communication with God is broken, and they can't appreciate the things of God. And so they are trying to satisfy their fleshly desires. That's all they have. Think about it this way a blind man and how he can't appreciate a sunset, right? Or a deaf man can't appreciate music. And that's the natural man. They can't enjoy the things of God because they are dead to God. I mean, think about it. 
Do you want to go to a Bible study tonight? Are you kidding me? Bible study? What are you talking about? It's, mid, it's in the middle of the week. There's a football game on. There's this going on. There's that going on. You see, they don't know the deep things of God. They don't know God. And they try to satisfy that hole in their heart with all kinds of other things. And isn't it interesting in a country, a nation that is so blessed. I mean, we are so blessed to live here. There are so many people that are so depressed. They can't even go on anymore. Look at the suicide rate. It's so sad. And I'm telling you, even as a Christian, we, we have those difficult times. That's when you need to bring it before the Lord, be in His Word, and be in fellowship with other believers. If it was all the things of this world, all the toys, all the things that are out there that would satisfy us, we should be the most, the happiest, the most satisfied nation in the world. And we're not. Because we've taken God out of the picture. And it's really hard. It's hard for us, imagine for them, who have no one who can cast all their cares at the Lord's feet. The, the psalmist said, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Ah, just the word of God, open it up to us, Lord. Martin Luther said, the Bible cannot be understood simply by study or talent. You must count only on the influence of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Vance uh, Havner gives us some insight. He said this, the wise Christian wastes no time trying to explain God's program to unregenerate men. He would be casting pearls before swine. He might as well try to describe a sunset to a blind man or discuss nuclear physics with a monument in the city park. The natural man cannot receive such things. One might as well try to catch sunbeams with a fish hook as to lay hold of God's revelation unassisted by the Holy Spirit. Unless one is born of the Spirit and taught by Him, all this is utterly foreign to him. Being a PhD does not help, for in this realm it can mean phenomenal dud. <laughs> I like that. Well then, how do people get saved? Because the Holy Spirit is wooing them. The Holy Spirit is with them, drawing them to Jesus. But we can resist what the Holy Spirit is doing. But when they come to Christ, the Holy Spirit's no longer with them. The Holy Spirit is in them. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them to empower them for the work of the ministry. Now, here in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15, Paul is saying that the natural man is not equipped to judge a spiritual man. He has no basis. That's not to say that the spiritual man is above criticism. Because Paul's dealing with errors within the Corinthian church in this letter, a lot of it. The thing is, the natural man doesn't see things as they should be. He says good is evil, evil is good. And think about it. For an unsaved person to recognize a, that a saved person is doing something wrong means that they must be pretty big, right? And God is so gracious with us. He will use unsaved people in our lives to correct us because he loves us that much. And isn't it, you're, you're just like, oh man, what was I thinking? You know, it's not like a brother or a sister came up to me and said, hey, you're doing something wrong. This is someone who's not even a believer. And they picked up at it. But praise God, he cares that much for us, that he will do that. Well, that's the natural man. Doesn't have the spirit, so he just does what he wants. Then Paul speaks of the spiritual man. Um, the Greek word here is that this person is spiritually minded. His mind is dominated with the Word of God, the will of God, and the work of God. And I think that's the whole idea when Paul speaks of the mind of Christ in verse 16 here. Now, this person lives on an entirely different level of existence than the natural man. And I think that's important for us to understand. We should be living on a different level of existence, right? Our, our passions, our desires should be different than that of the world. Again, what the church has done many times is they brought the world into the church and they, make, they allow their people to move down 
and not up to the level that God wants them to live. Why are we living by worldly standards? Why aren't we living to, according to the high calling by which we've been called? The Lord said, be holy, for I am holy. He didn't say, be as holy as I am, because that would be impossible, right? He said, be holy, for I am holy. Represent me. Now, in verse 16 here, one other point I want to bring out. Paul quotes from Isaiah 40, 13. And he's speaking of the mind of the Lord, the mind of Yahweh, is how it's presented in Isaiah 40, 13. It's interesting, because Paul changes it. And he says, but we have the mind of Christ. He's speaking about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is Yahweh. Isn't that great? And here's the wonderful thing. We can know the mind of God because the Spirit of God can be understood by each and every one of us. As you study the Word of God, as you listen to teachers and are obedient to what the Holy Spirit is showing you, what God has given to us, we are seeing into the mind of God and renewing our minds with the things of God. And don't we need that, especially as we're out in the world all the time and you know, it just kind of drags us down and we get dirty being out in the world and we need the cleansing, the washing of the Word to cleanse ourselves. How important that is. Well, look at chapter 3, verse 1, First Corinthians. And I, brethren, could not speak to us to spiritual people, but as the carnal, as the babes in Christ. So we've spoken of the natural man, the spiritual man. Paul now speaks about the carnal man. And here's the problem. Some people have a hard time with this. They don't believe you can be a Christian and be carnal. But what is Paul saying here? Again, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. Paul shows us these are immature Christians, carnal Christians. He calls them brethren, babes in Christ. So they're Christians. But they're not growing up. And the Greek word that Paul uses for carnal, sarkinos, speaks of being characterized by the flesh or being dominated by the flesh. You know, the message of the cross is more than just justification. It speaks of our sanctification. The moment we are justified, all our sins are paid in full, cast as far as the east is from the west, it's a done deal, we're saved. The sanctification process begins where God is cleansing us, taking that garbage out of our lives. And it is a lifelong process. It's not something that happens instantaneously. I would love to wake up one morning, you know, I just got saved yesterday, and here I am, new day. I'm fine, I'm perfect, I have no problems at all. I, everything I do is great. Not. Again, thank God Julie's not here tonight because she would tell you otherwise. No, you should see him. He's not that great. That's the problem. It's that sanctification where God is working in us, purging us of that garbage. And we beat ourselves up. Uh, I, I'm just not good enough. We, you're not. You never will be good enough, but he is, and he's working in you, and he's not going to give up because he says the work that he's begun in you, he's going to complete. We give up on ourselves. I'm not good enough. True. I'm not going to argue that point. You're not good enough. But he's working in you. And Paul said the work he has begun in you, he will complete. doesn't say you will complete. Praise God for that, right? He will complete the work he started in you. And it's a lifelong process. But if you allow the world to control your life, you will remain carnal, fleshly. You're not going to grow up. And that was the church in Corinth. They saw themselves as spiritual, and Paul is saying that they are far from that. They, they were using all the spiritual gifts, you know, things were great, they... They thought, man, look at us. We forget about God's grace. Do you really think God uses us because we're so great? I actually had someone tell me, you know, why do you think we're being blessed so much? Uh, God's grace? Not because you're so great? Not because you're perfect? If you think that, you're in serious trouble. I don't want to be too close to you. It's grace. You look at this church in Corinth, they were the most carnal, carnal church. Paul is correcting them and correcting them and correcting them. And yet they were using the gifts just in a bad way. 
is all about them. You know, I love little kids because they're, they're, they're just so funny. They, they think they're so big and strong, you know, and they, they, they're this, oh, yeah, look at me. And that was the church in Corinth. They're like little kids. Look at me. And that's the wrong picture. Look at him. If you want to look at me, you're in trouble. Look at what he's doing, not at what I'm doing. Perspective. Well, verse 2. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. You know, Paul spent 18 months there in Corinth, and yet when he left, he considered them babies in their faith. And then at the time of this epistle, he says, even now, you are still carnal. How could that be? You're not digging into the meat of the scriptures. You're taking only milk, baby food. It's interesting because that's kind of the message in a positive note that we're doing on Sunday as we look at Joshua. You know, from milk to meat, moving to the deep things of God. Maybe that's why we missed two Thursday evenings, so we can be on the same page on Sunday. I don't know. And you got to live up to the basics that you have, and God will keep growing you. Now, here's the other problem. Is that, yes, sometimes as people hear the word of God, they don't apply it to their lives, they don't grow, they don't mature like they should. But also, we have pastors who are feeding the people of God milk. Milk, 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 milk. All the time. One writer put it like this. For a Christian pre preacher to, or teacher to give only milk week after week, year after year, is a crime against the word of God and the Holy Spirit. It cannot be done without neglecting much of the word and without neglecting the leading and empowering of the Holy Spirit, the supreme teacher and illuminator. It is also a terrible disservice to those who hear whether or not they are satisfied with having only milk. The appetite must be created. Nothing is more precious or wonderful than a little baby, but a 20-year-old with the mind of an infant is heartbreaking. A baby who acts like a baby is a joy, but an adult who acts like a baby is a tragedy. It doubtlessly grieved the Holy Spirit as it grieved Paul that the Christians in Corinth had never gotten out of their spiritual infancy. This tragedy is immensely worse than that or the physically or mentally retarded, who have no responsibility for their conditions. Spiritual retardation, however, is always primarily our own doing. We may not have the best human preacher or teacher, but every believer has the perfect teacher within, who belongs to instruct him in the things of God. If we do not grow spiritually, the reason is always that we are still fleshly. The believer's growth times are those times when he walks in the Spirit. It is essential to understand that carnality is not an absolute state in which a believer exists, but a behavior pattern he chooses one moment at a time. To say it another way, a Christian is not fleshy in the sense of being, but in the sense of behaving. Exactly. And what was their carnality all about? Well, Paul goes on to say, look at verse 3 here in 2 Corinthians 3. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy and strife and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos. Are you not carnal? Make no mistake about it, Corinth was a very wicked and immoral city. And the church was influenced by these worldly activities, these worldly things. And for the church, it was a matter of the heart. They allowed their feelings to cause divisions. They were envious of others. They quarreled with each other. That's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a work of the flesh. And again, these guys thought that they were spiritual, but their division showed you're fleshly, you're worldly. If he put it like this, he said, spiritual people are to walk in the Spirit. If they do otherwise, they are worldly and are called upon to desist. Remaining worldly is not one of the options. Absolutely. Look at the problems that were going on in this church. Look at verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. They were fighting over who's the greatest, Paul or Apollos. And Paul said, you guys are ridiculous. You're fools. You're fighting over that which is nothing. Is nothing greater than nothing? Makes no sense. Ironside said, imagine a household divided over servants. That's exactly what we are, servants of God. Are we dividing? And it's still a problem today. I know someone who is walking with another brother in the Lord, and this brother asked about evangelism and what they were doing, and they said that they're going to be in the Christmas parade in town with their church. And the brother asked, hey, can we help? Can we do anything to, to assist you? And he was told, oh, no, this is for our church. I'll give you some really good insight here. There are no churches in heaven. There are people who love the Lord. Can you imagine in heaven if there were churches all divided up in their little groups? Are we here for the kingdom of God, for the cause of Christ? Now, I'm not saying if, if a church is not, you know, presenting the gospel message correctly that you work with them. But this church was, and we are, and who cares what church you go to? If you want us to promote your church, I don't care. We want to promote the gospel. Sad. Paul, Apollos, were not in competition with each other. They were working together for what? For the cause of Christ. And that's the key. Don't lose sight of that. We are working for the cause of Christ. And as we read on, Paul is going to focus on this thought next, working together for the common goal of Christ. Look at what he says in verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. So combating the Corinthian desire to divide among leaders, Paul says you guys are all on the same team. Imagine a football team that was divided. I mean, I, I, I don't remember the, the football player's name, uh, but I believe he played on the Minnesota Vikings. But if the play wasn't going to him, he did things half-heartedly, which obviously gave the opposing team, there's no way this guy's getting the ball. You do it wholeheartedly. And it affected the team. And not in a good way. We are working together, not to build up our church, our ministry, or our this or our that, but the kingdom of God. That's what's really important here. And Paul says, according to his own labor, not according to his own results. What do we do? According to our own results. Go to a conference as pastor, as a pastor. Go to a conference and see how many times they ask you, how many people are in your church? I don't even know how to answer that. Why? You know my answer, the exact number that God wants. Why? Because God adds to the church daily those being saved. It's according to our labor, not our results. We labor for the Lord. We go out doing the work. God brings forth the fruit. Now, years ago, young preachers used to ask G. Campbell Morgan the secret to his preaching success. And this is how he would answer. I always say to them the same thing. Work, hard work, and again, work. People don't like to hear that today. They want it easy. I don't know. I mean, even if you just look at the New Testament, and you just study the life of Paul, is this guy a hard worker? Absolutely. He worked and worked and worked because he loved the Lord. It wasn't like, I have to do this. I get to serve the Lord. And that should be the response for each one of us. Now, someone had told me that, you know, I have no joy serving anymore. Stop. Stop. Don't do it. You're not helping yourself and you're not helping anyone else. There's no point to it. 
if you're not doing it because you love the Lord and it just brings you great joy to serve Him, then get out. But what happens is we base our joy, the work we do, on how others respond. I didn't get the pat on the back. They made me angry. They did this. They did that. I'm not doing this anymore. Don't. Until you get your heart right. Because service is a privilege. We are serving the King of kings and Lord of lords. And if we can't do it with joy, we shouldn't do it. I'm not saying we don't get tired. Paul got tired. He got discouraged. Don't we all do that? Yeah. But it's that joy. Understanding we get to serve. Wow. I mean, I don't know anyone else that would hire me. I thank God for that. He gives me the opportunity. How awesome that is. And we're not in competition with each other. We're working for the cause of Christ. Look at verse 10 here in Second or 1 Corinthians 3. Where Paul said this, According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. How could Paul do what he was doing for the Lord? He said, it's the grace of God which was given to me. I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy of it. God's grace, he allows me to do it. How could we be doing the things for the, these things for the Lord? Because the grace of God which was given to us. How we do it? And Paul talks about laying down a foundation. What foundation? It's about Jesus. That's the foundation. That's what we build upon. Peter said in Acts 4, verses 11 and 12, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you don't have a solid foundation, the structure is going to be weak and fall apart. Our foundation is Jesus Christ. And if you build upon that, it's a stable foundation. But if you remove Christ, man, it's an unstable foundation, and look out. In fact, in Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians, he warns them in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4. He says, But I fear lest somehow, as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Why do we allow these things into our hearts and minds? People come up with all kinds of crazy things. Oh, this is so good. you got to read this. And, you know, it's usually the simplest thing. Well, that just goes against what the Scriptures say. Why do I want to fill my minds with it? I will read what Mormons bring to the door if they read what I give them. I will read what Jehovah Witnesses bring, but they'll never read what I give them because they can't. Why? Because the truth will set them free. And their leaders don't want them to read that stuff. I don't fear those things because the truth always sets me free. I always compare what they have to the Word of God, but that doesn't add up. So this is wrong and God's Word is right. It's simple. But people don't do that today. I don't know why. It's foolish. Paul also says that our work is going to be tested through the fire to see what the motives of our heart were in serving. What we're building with. Isn't that interesting? The motives of our heart. Why are you doing what you're doing? To get recognition. That's a bad motive. Why are we doing what we're doing for the Lord? Is it out of love for Him? We need to be careful. 
And God's going to judge also the quality of our work. And Paul picks up on this in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 and 10. He said, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So not just the motives, but, you know, what's the quality of our work? Are we giving our best effort in what we're doing for the Lord? That's important. Now let me also say this. This is not a judgment for salvation. This is for rewards or crowns. And I believe the Lord rewards us with these crowns that we re present right back to him. Because the Lord's given us this ability to do these things. Remember in Revelation 4, verses 9 through 11, and this is from the King James Version. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne, who liveth for, forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I think the 24 elders represent Jews and Gentiles, the body of Christ, here in Revelation 4. And we are saved by faith. It has nothing to do with our salvation here or judgment in that regard, but our rewards. That we are going to cast our crowns that God has given to us for the things we've done back at his feet. Paul also says here in verse 15 again in 1 Corinthians 3, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. You see, it's not for salvation. It's for rewards. And I think we all want to cast our crowns before the Lord. So make sure you serve with the right heart. What are the motives? And you do your best. I'm not saying we're perfect. We're not. None of us are. But you do your best for the Lord. I think that's important. And I love what Jesus said in Revelation 22, 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Oh, thank you, Lord. He's going to give it to us, and we can give it right back, cast it before him. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, right? Now, let me also say this. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that this verse speaks of purgatory. And so before you can go to heaven, you have to pass through the fire and be purified. That is not at all what this passage is teaching because the fire does not purify the worker, does it? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the things we do. If they're burned up, wrong motive. You didn't do, do it uh, with good quality. Not for our salvation. You know, Paul in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, can you imagine if our salvation was based on our good works? How many of you would know that you're saved? None of us. And maybe you felt, hey, I did good today. But what if you get in your car tonight, someone cuts you off, you know, you get a little angry and say a couple things, and all of a sudden you get in an accident and you're dead. Then what happens? See, you could never know if you're saved or not if it was based on our good works. It's based on his finished work. And we could take that to the bank. That's why we could have confidence of our salvation, because it's based upon him. And again, I'm so thankful for that. Now, Paul said, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Very simple. Well, look at verse 16 here in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. It's interesting, because Paul doesn't use the Greek word herion for temple. It speaks of the whole structure. He speaks of nails, which speaks of the sanctuary, or the holy place, the place where God dwells. Isn't that interesting? Our bodies are the temple of God. And who dwells in us? Oh, the Spirit of God. Just like in the temple. The glory of God, you know, was above the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. 
in the temple, in the tabernacle. And I think, yes, our physical bodies, we should take care of them, but don't go crazy because you could be the healthiest person that dies one day. Take care of them, though. They are the temple of God. Don't abuse them. I think that's important. Our spiritual bodies, yeah. We need to feed our spirit the things of God to grow and mature in the faith. In fact, I think the bigger picture here is the church. And if you turn from the church, if you're causing division, living in carnality, false teaching, and so on, you can destroy the church by your actions. And the Greek word for, that's used for you in these verses is in the plural. And it's not necessarily speaking of the individual, but Christians collectively. And that's what makes up the church. The church is not a building. It's Christians, people. Paul says, if anyone, in verse 17, defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. God will destroy him. Who's Paul speaking of? I think he's speaking of false teachers who are not true believers in the Lord Jesus. And when you look at the destruction, the vision that false teachers bring into the church, we shouldn't be surprised that God will deal with them. I feel sorry for some of these guys. They just dishonor God by what they're teaching, what they're bringing forth. It's, ho it's horrible. And you think, you know, in the day and age we're living in, where every person can have a Bible in this nation, we should know better. But we fall prey. Let's look at verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Now, I could be wrong on this, but I think Paul is being a little sarcastic here in verse 18 because the Corinthians considered themselves to be wise in this world. In fact, that was their problem, was a problem in the church as well. Their love for worldly wisdom, it led to pride in their lives and caused divisions in the church. And, you know, Paul says you, you have to become a fool. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, not, you know, don't turn off your brain. That's not what he's saying. Paul was talking about lovers of human wisdom, philosophy that was brought into the church. You need to forget humanism or a man-centered philosophy and have a Christ-centered look on things. Forget the wisdom. Be a fool to the wisdom of this world, but focus on what God has. You know, Paul said, remember in Colossians, you know, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So as we surrender to God, the world tends to think we're foolish. God says we're wise because we have the wisdom of God in our lives and not the wisdom of this world, which is in a constant state of flux. Let's finish up. Look at verse 21. Therefore, let no one glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God's. Let me ask you this. Are we more excited, you know, seeing a, a movie star or going to a football game or seeing a football star or whatever instead of, you know, going to church or reading God's Word? I will tell you, just for me personally, I don't care if the Bears were in the Super Bowl on a Sunday or they're playing for a big game on a Thursday night. It would not cause me to miss church. It's a game. This is life. This is more important to me. Do I have fun with sports? I absolutely do. Because sports is entertainment. That's all it is. At the end of the day, one wins, one loses, and you go on with your life. Right? But this is life changing. This is more important. 
You see, are we going to boast in men instead of God? And I'm not saying it's wrong, you know, to go to football games or whatever, but boy, don't let it take your time away from God and what He has for you. Don't boast over so many other things than what the Lord has given you. In Jeremiah 9, verses 24, 23 and 24, the Lord said this, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. What do we glory in? That we know God? Isn't that an amazing thing? The creator of heaven and earth we know and we can talk to and he listens to us any time of day or night. That's an amazing thing. You know, Paul spoke of the divisions that were going on in Corinth in the church. And the solution to these overcoming these divisions is really simple. Jesus. Oh, that's so simplistic. Why does it have to be difficult? Why does it have to be so complicated? Why can't it be Jesus? Because then I have to change. But they have to change too. Oh. I have to change. And that gets in, pride gets in the way. But I'm right and they're wrong. So there. Put Jesus there. See, I, I truly believe if your relationship with Jesus is right, then your relationship with your brothers and sisters in the Lord will be right also. I'm not saying they're going to get along with you. I'm saying your relationship will be right with them. And that's what God is doing. You can't change them. They can't change you. But you can surrender to God and let him change your life. I think that's really important. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, 17 said, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. We're in union with him. We, his desires become our desires. And he's maturing us, helping us to grow. And I love what he says here in 1 Corinthians 3, 22. Paul said, All are yours. And I think it really speaks of Christian liberty, that we're free to do whatever we want. We're in Christ. We have that freedom. Now, before people go crazy with that, Paul also said in this verse, and you are Christ, which puts things into balance for us. A Christian liberty and a Christian responsibility, and they go hand in hand, and you'll do what's right. All Christians belong to Christ, but some in Corinth were claiming to belong to him to the exclusion of all others. When they formed their little groups and got together, we're the ones following Jesus. We're following Paul. We're following Cephas. We're following Apollos. We're following who knows who. No. Stop it. We are Jesus' servants, even as he was the Father's servant. He emptied himself and submitted to what the Father wanted him to do. Who are we to say, I'm not going to do that. We have to surrender to the Lord and do His will. Now I'll leave you with this. Verses 16 and 17 here in 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. What temple are you? Who is residing in your life? Who is on the throne of your heart? needs to be the Lord Jesus Christ because whoever it is, that is what's going to be manifested in your life. May people see Jesus in us. And again, it's a lifelong process and we struggle, we, have, we fail, but God is always right there picking us up, getting us back on our feet again so we can shine for Him. So we can mature in the faith and not remain spiritual babes in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your, your wonderful words this evening. It's so good to get together to worship you and to study your word and have your spirit teach us the things we need to 
learn. Help us to apply these things to our lives. Less of us, more of you, Lord, in each of us. Help us to grow, to mature in the faith, to be more like you. That we would shine brightly to a world that's lost in sin, to a world that many will never read the Bible, but they will read our lives. And may, we, they, may they see Jesus in us. We love you and thank you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.